Hello everybody and welcome back to B2B Nav, uh, our final episode of the year, I think. Um, so yeah, welcome back. Uh, this week we are going to focus on the topic of excuses. Um, I'll leave you got an excuse for this one. <laughs> um, well, I think the main one that we, we always hear yeah. time and time again, and I am... Um, sick to death of giving is yeah. that we've not had time to do something or we're too busy to do You're something sick giving that i'm sick to death of giving that excuse i've yeah. found that like I've, earlier in the year particularly people kept like walking up to me and going like how are you doing i was like oh busy and i realized i was saying that four times a day and i'm yeah. sure i still do it sometimes but i've yeah. tried to cut down because it's if nothing else it's really annoying for me to keep saying on that i think it's something that i say to everybody if someone says to me how are you on a daily basis but, they don't want to know how busy I am, but that seems to be my default answer is, yeah, just really busy. I'm yeah. really busy. Because if somebody asks for how you're doing, they just want to know you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you false fine? Are you really fine? No, I think, I think it's come up a lot in, in our place in work recently uh, in relation to, obviously, we've reached the end of uh, the calendar year. A lot of people set a lot of objectives at the start of the year, where they wanted to head, what they wanted to do, um, the progress they wanted to make in various areas of the business um, this year. And I think the most common thing that seems to be met as to why um what holding yourself accountable to why we haven't made the progress we wanted to seems to be i didn't have enough time yeah where's your stance on that then i think that it's true in a sense okay because there isn't enough time in the world to do everything you want to do okay when like i was a student i sat around playing games and watching tv and stuff like that a lot i don't have the time to do that now because i have a job that takes up let's say a, at least eight hours a day mm -hmm. i've got a family at home yeah. got things to do so that there isn't enough time to do everything you want to do in the world and that yeah. kind of applies to the workplace too to some extent okay but that's where i guess prioritization comes in and making sure that you're spending your time wisely doing the right things yeah i think I think, uh, looking back at my earlier career, you tend to get pulled into areas that you know you shouldn't be doing. Mm. And I don't know if you still feel guilty of that. I know I do. That you, when it comes down to priorities, my priorities are set in a certain order of things. As you say, work, family. I don't know if that's you know, an order. Hopefully, hopefully I don't get quoted on that. But in the sense <laughs> of, you know, you have your work commitments, your family commitments, your out of work commitments. But then how you choose to spend your time in work, focusing on that from like the office environment perspective, I guess from the first instance, is absolutely critical to how your week pans out, the mm -hmm. progress you make, and, uh, the progress you're making, um, I guess, and um, how effective you are in work. Yeah. Because I think where I still get distracted and you still get pulled away from things is more where you focus your attention on something, and I say beneath you, but I don't mean that in a derogatory manner to anybody, but something that you've done before or yeah. something that you know you're already good at. And rather than pushing your boundaries and testing yourself, which is a lot harder, you default back to whatever is the easiest thing that you could be doing for those for those moments. Yes, yeah, I'm sure we all do that at one point or another. But um, how do you how do you break that mold then, so you don't have to constantly give the excuse of "oh, sorry, I've just not had enough time." I think it's about knowing the, who you've got around you to help support you, and knowing who you can pass things to, and having that in mind already, so yeah. that you don't. I think otherwise, the default is that you're going to pick it up and, and you're going to do it. Yeah. So, as a small example, the other day we had um, a minor problem with our CRM that it resulted in duplicate contacts. I thought you were going to say deleted my entire calendar. <laughs> that was an old problem that's been resolved. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but it just, um, so we had to kind of go in and, and sort a lot of that out. I yeah. did do some of it myself, but I also got another member of the team to help me out because if I didn't know he could already help there, I would have done it all myself. Yeah. But the fact that I already knew we had somebody here that could help out and, and help resolve that problem, I didn't just end up plowing hours into it myself. We divided the work and got it done in, you know, an hour or so. Okay. But taking to your, like your team, mm -hmm. you know, you've been the tech and digital side of things here at BDB. Um, I had an interest in meeting with some external trainers recently trying to develop some leadership training for the, the, kind of the Leaders of Tomorrow program that we're looking at implementing here at BDB. Yep. Um, and one of the questions that I got asked, which is one of the most basic questions you could be asked that I struggle to answer was, well, what's the implication of somebody not doing something? So, you know, this, you know we, set, we set objectives, me and you do, what, what, what you want to achieve, how far you want to go with something. If you don't do it, what's the actual fallout of it? And my answer here was not a lot. And you have to reflect on it because we, we do have our culture around freedom and responsibility there's an awful lot of autonomy in the roles but there's no financial implication there's no i guess it depends on who we're talking about and what what specific thing it is so i think yeah, okay. i think for you and i the the 
main repercussion of not doing something is that something doesn't progress, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily stop what's kind of already taking along and everything like that. Yeah. Because if you start, <clears throat> start thinking about, like you say, members of the digital team, if they don't do something, it could be that a campaign is not being run as effectively as it could be, or something's not getting set up, yeah. or a website's not progressing if they don't focus on it, things like that. Yeah. So I guess it comes down to very much kind of what your role is and what those what those things are. But I think definitely for you and I, it's probably more in the in that end of, you're just not growing and you're not setting yourself up as well for the future. Yeah. Which I think is, it probably makes it easier to, to kind of drop the ball at times and yeah. not follow up on it because nobody's chasing you. There's no instant kind of problem if you don't do whatever it is you need to be doing really. Yeah. So creating that <coughs> sense of accountability in the yeah. people in the team. Because that's what most, most agencies, businesses, clients will struggle with. Because I wonder how many of the people will be sat there listening to this or watching this today and they've been through their end of year review and or they're doing appraisals with people, or they're doing PDRs or whatever it may be, and you know that's certainly a cycle that we're in at the minute. Um, and the number of times, yeah, no, I've just not had enough time, I've not had enough time. And then when you say, well, you probably have, which is what I've said back to several people, it's met with a real look of disdain on their face. Yeah. Well, I've been very busy, very busy. So how, how do you how do you break that down with that individual? Because it, I think it's a really, it's a tough area to get around this, and probably something that a lot of different businesses struggle with. Yeah. But I think tying it back to the job description, the job role, the objectives that were set, and then people come up with every other excuse under the sun as well as to why they've not been, why they've not done it. You know, obviously it's probably somebody else's fault that somebody else didn't do something that they were wholly reliant on to actually deliver their part of the puzzle or whatever it may be. But this whole excuse around not having enough time, and I've seen people do exercises where they break down the working week, how many hours have you got in a year? You know, you've probably seen it on social media at various points when they put mm -hmm. a big number up and that's how many minutes you've got in a year to fill and if you divide your time up. And we did it even earlier this year, didn't we, with the, how long you're spending on your phone? Yeah. But I think that's a, that is true. I think you, there is a limited amount of time, but that's why, we, as I say, you just have to figure out what's taking that time up and what is the most important. Is that and like it's taking a, out the distractions and the inefficiencies then? To some extent as well, because I think, I think that's another thing, which is... And I know I'm guilty of this. Sometimes you'll say in the... Uh, well, you're today, easily distracted. No, no, but like it's uh, saying like, okay, it's Tuesday. I want to go. Th it's Wednesday. I don't know why I'm saying it's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty before it's not. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to um, I want to do these six things today. I'm allotting an hour for each of them and I'll have an hour to catch up on emails or whatever. Yeah. And then you start doing that first one. It's a bit harder than you thought and you plow through three hours and yeah. you've got one thing done that might even not be the most important thing yeah. or it could be as important as the other things, but you've not, you've not stuck to that time. Yeah. Whereas if you'd have really focused on trying to get it done in that hour, I'd say there's a reasonable chance you would have got it done in the hour or you could have put it down and picked it up again when you're not interfering with everything else if it really couldn't have been done within that time. Yeah. So I think that comes down to, I guess, holding yourself accountable to the time that you've I said you're going to be setting on it and not and not just letting it kind of overtake everything. I think that's still my biggest struggle to this day, that what you just said, in terms of you can put the time aside, you can plan your week out within a beautiful beautiful planner of everything. It's really easy on. to block out slots in Outlook, but you actually have to stick to them. Otherwise, it's a bit meaningless. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at Sophie over my shoulder. She's <laughs> nodding at me. Yeah, I know. I mean, we're all that. guilty of it, and I suspect uh, most of the people listening to this have, have done that at one time or another as well. Every company I've worked at, you've had meetings set in the diary with people, or you've put time aside. Yeah. And either you or they, at one time or another, will plow right through that meeting, and and you won't have done something that, in, at least when you set that, you thought was important enough to set. Well, I think it's respecting the importance of those meetings, so isn't it? And maybe that's something that I need to work on harder in the new year because I think those, when you do get the meetings in and you, you have them, you can feel that you're making progress and things are getting sorted or resolved. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, because that's what we were sort of saying last week a little bit on the podcast in terms of not allowing yourself to be distracted. Because if you want to see the results, you can't afford to have those distractions. Um, and it may, maybe it involves having a bit more faith in other people in the team as well, of trust, trusting them that they will deliver, they will step up in your absence, which, um, yeah, being a self-confessed control freak, I find it a bit <laughs> difficult at times. But, um, okay, yeah, okay. So, I guess, what other good excuses have you heard for people not doing things? I think, I guess you touched on one before, uh, briefly, which was the uh, relying on other people. Yeah. And, and letting that be the reason that you've not done something unrealistically. The blame game. Yeah, when... Yes, that other person might have in theory been the person that should be driving it, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that stops you as a project manager or whatever else you might be yeah. following up with that person and trying to nudge that along too because people will drop the ball yeah. if you don't follow up with them at one time or another. Yeah. Somebody will 
fail to do what they expected of them. So the surest way to make sure it happens is to talk to them as things are going and, and make sure that you're encouraging them, keeping that task, whatever it might be, top of mind. Yeah. Um, whereas, yeah, it's great to be like, I've handed that to you, I'll just forget about it now, but that's that's a sure way to make sure that it's that's not going to get done. Get a lot of people like that at work, they don't just fire it off their to-do list onto yours. Yeah. But then somebody said to me earlier on in my career that you can't delegate responsibility. And that's something that's always, always stuck with me. That you can delegate a task and you can delegate a, a, you know, a, a, an action, yeah. but you can't delegate responsibility. If you still own that, you know, it's like you, you delegate plenty of tasks, I'm sure, to the digital and the tech team. Clearly, in my role, I delegate lots of tasks to other people, but it's still my responsibility to make sure yeah. they've been done and completed and driven. And I think that that ties back to me, even in the PDRs and the reviews. And when somebody says to me, I've not had enough time to do that, really, I should have driven them harder to make sure they did it. And yeah. that, I think in the, in the, as you get more senior, you've got to take responsibility for that, that the, the book the book stops with you ultimately so i think we see the same thing with like um proposals for for clients and things like that yeah it you need to have that person that's the the one responsible the person for it the lead because otherwise you will end up in a situation where everybody goes off and you all come back with your bits at some point or another but yeah. not necessarily at the right time and yeah. it gets dropped and that's not cohesive yeah whereas if you've got that one person leading it they're the ones that can can follow up on it make sure everybody's doing their job make sure it all comes together at the right time i think that's one of the one of the one of the best things we've done this year on the new, on the new business and the pitching side of the kind of assigning those leads and it's worked it's not worked every time for us perfectly obviously as we're learning but um i think assigning that responsibility to somebody that if you turn around to them at the end of it and we've missed the deadline or the quality's not there or something doesn't hang together or somebody's not delivered it's on their shoulders and that one individual and i think that drives everybody in the team to try that bit harder because they know they know their heads on the chopping block as in the individual so they want to deliver for their teammate and make sure they get it right um, but yeah, no, I think that's been a, a big learning point for me in terms of assigning that responsibility to somebody. But then even then, still, I'd still say it still sits with me the responsibility to make sure that goes out on time. We don't we don't let ourselves down on that kind of the, the pitch situation, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so time's certainly a big excuse, is what we're hearing at the minute. <laughs> um, what about in terms of do you think do you think people avoid things because it's just too difficult? Is that really, I don't, is that really I don't know if people here? subconsciously do it or if it's intentional, but I do think that happens. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know I do that, not necessarily because it's too difficult. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I'll try and tackle the hardest first and then it ends up plowing through all the ones that would have been quick and easy How to do. How do you do that? Do you, if you've got a to-do list and there's 10 things on it, do you go hard too easy? I think I'll, I try and do it in priority order and that'll usually involve starting yeah. with the hardest as well because like the, the hardest is usually, I think, the, the most important thing usually. Yeah. Um, but then there's a risk of it ruining your day as you say yeah. it takes a lot of through the other things or... that might be medium importance but in some cases those are like 10 minute jobs and you could really get a lot of them done yeah. instead of instead of letting that one big thing to kind of tie everything up so yeah. Yeah. I think it's tough it probably involves finding the right balance I've tried all sorts of different <laughs> systems I'm smoking to myself here because I've tried locking time out in diary I've tried dedicating days to different bits of activities Yeah. so having like a, a finance day a uh, a marketing day, an IMG day, a, a Medulla day, all these different things, and you're trying to carve your time out in that way, and that doesn't seem to work at all either. I found that that can, well, it depends what you're doing, I suppose, but that can work for me yeah. um, when you when you can dedicate that time without the distraction. Because obviously yeah. there are other things going on. We're in a business. We've got lots of other people that you can help support and other projects that need support and things like that. So it's not always practical to say this is my day to do this, so I'm not going to be supporting in other areas or I'm yeah. going to be working out somewhere else to focus on this, but other people might need you and things like that. But I found for me, it just helps me, <clears throat> when I have done it, stay in the right headspace yeah. so that kind of my mind is all on that same subject yeah. and I'm not getting getting too uh, distracted because I think that you, you can find that quite a lot, yeah. particularly with things like <clears throat> meetings and calls and things like that because you get, I think... My emails, notifications, yeah. you name it. I'm well, you've email. got things like that, but I was just going to say, I think when you're in a meeting, it's a very different zone to when you're trying to get your head down and work on something. Yeah. So I find it incredibly difficult to switch between those two modes. Okay. So if you have a, a meeting and a half an hour break and then another meeting and a half an hour break, I'd say within those half an hour breaks, I'm probably very unproductive compared to if I'd have had all the meetings grouped together, like in the afternoon, for example. Yeah, no, I try and do that when I have commercial meetings and work and stuff like that. We try to put them back to back for a reason. Yeah. Because if I have a 15 minute gap in between, I'll spend that 15 minutes. But you need a little coffee, bit of a cool down. A chat. I don't know, like, yeah, it's not. I think it's easy to, to like, underestimate how draining a meeting can be as well because it requires a lot of focus and attention especially if they're multiple hours long because you need to be on your game the whole time and paying attention and answering questions yeah so when you come out of it you kind of do need a few minutes break to kind of collect yourself grab a drink and then if, the, if you've got another one coming up you're not going to start doing anything else in the 10 15 minutes that are left yeah yeah, yeah. 
Okay, okay. Might be a brief one, this one. I'm feeling, I'm feeling like we can't take this one much further in this sense. But in this, I guess what, what we're saying ultimately is it comes down to prioritisation. And minimalisation of distractions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but if you can get those two things right, I think the other, the, other, the other kind of thing that I would leave it with is more around if, if you find yourself making the excuse that you've not had time or not had enough time, it's already too late in the sense of for the person that owns the responsibility for that and yourself, because to get to the end of a year or the end of a review or the end of a period and say, I've not had time, well, surely that should have been raised along the way somewhere, yeah. that you're at capacity and you're struggling to deliver on what clearly at the time was set as a business priority. Yeah. So I, don't, I, don't, I just don't believe in the fact that people don't have time. I think it'd be a much braver thing to say it just wasn't, I didn't see it as a priority. Yeah, and um, I think it'd be more, more accurate as well. Um, I think I have more respect for people. I didn't have time. You have had time. That's that's always my point. I, I say to myself, I hold myself accountable to it. You have had time to do that. I think one of my favourite sayings, phrases, whatever you want to call it, um, that I heard along these lines, and I'm, I'm sure I've brought it up before on these uh, podcasts, is trust is doing what you said you are going to do. Yeah. So uh, if, if you said you're going to do something as an objective, and then six months later you're saying, I've not done that because I didn't have time, there's been no communication in between, that it's been deprioritized, or that you've not done it for whatever reason, yeah. then each time you do that, you're damaging that trust a little bit. If I ask you to do something else, are you going to do that? Yeah. No, so absolutely. It's, it's, it's certainly, it certainly can really damage the relationship. And especially if you've got somebody more senior trying to respect that delegation and trying to invest in... Well, it just means that people you're going to end up world. diving in again, aren't absolutely, you? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So I guess entering the new year when lots of people will be setting new targets, thinking about what you think is your priority for 2020. Um, you know, hold yourself accountable to those. Check in regularly. Um, you know, and if you hear that excuse from somebody, I've not had time. Not, not really good enough, in my opinion. Must do better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we talked about it as well a couple of years ago, which is just setting regular KPIs, even if you're not, like, doing the whole thing that you need to do, the whole task, the whole yeah. thing at once. Make sure you're, you're at least moving in the right direction so it is progressing a little bit. Take it in more bite-sized yeah. chunks. I suppose a bit of a weird analogy, but if you're going to be paying off a loan, you're not generally paying off £5,000 at once. You're usually paying off, let's say, £50 a month a little bit at a time, and it, eventually it's all done. Hopefully. <laughs> Unless you top up the loan or making excuses <laughs> to why you need more money. Um, okay, great stuff. I'm going to wrap it up there for this one. Um, a random little episode, but I quite enjoyed it. Um, feel free to check us out on www.b2bknowledge.com so our content hub for all things b2b helping clients prospects and contacts navigate the ever-evolving b2b marketing landscape uh, we'll be back in the new year with some new topics and some new guests and um, talking i think kicking off the new year with all things talent culture um, remuneration and reward with one of our recruitment partners um, and yeah in the meantime have a fantastic christmas a great new year and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks.